Genesis 26, beginning in verse 15. Genesis 26, 15. Now, all the wells which Isaac's father, that's Abraham, his, uh, Abraham's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines stopped them up by filling them with earth. And then Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us, you're too powerful for us. And Isaac departed from there and he camped in the valley of Gerar and he settled there. Then Isaac dug again the wells of water which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham and he gave them the same names which his father had given them. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of flowing water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with the herdsmen of Isaac saying, the water's ours. So he named the well Ezek because they contended with him. Then they dug another well, and well, they quarreled over it too, so he named it Sitna. And he moved away from there, and he dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it, so he named it Rehoboth, for he said, at last the Lord has made room for us, and we will be fruitful in the land. Uh, then, the, then he went up from there to Beersheba. The Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and I will multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. So he built an altar there and he called upon the name of the Lord and he pitched his tent there and there Isaac's servants dug a well. Then Abimelech came to him from Gerar with his advisor Azuzath and he called the commander of his army. And Isaac said to them, why have you come to me since you hate me and have sent me away from you? And they said, well, we see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, let there now be an oath between us, even between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm, just as, you have not, uh, just as we have not touched you and have not done nothing but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. Then he made them a feast, and they ate and they drank, and in the morning they arose early, exchanged oaths. Then Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace." Now it came about on the same day that Isaac's servants came in, told him about the well which they had dug, and said to him, We have found water. So he called it Sheba. Therefore the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. And when Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Beri, the Hittite, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon, not related to Musk, the Hittite. And they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Father, the history of your people that you record, every word, every verse, every page, Lord, is going to be with us in eternity. And Lord, we won't, we won't uh, take out of it tonight everything that's here, but we do ask for those things that we need tonight. We ask for the things we need to learn or relearn. Teach us about Isaac's faith. Teach us how to have faith a faith that's healthy, Lord, living in this world. We pray you give us strength, energy, and really answer the desires of our heart as you open your word to us. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. So I remember the night as though it were tonight. It was a long time ago now, but I was a... I had been a Christian for about four years, and um, maybe like some of you, you know, I prayed to receive Christ. I knew that God was real. I knew Jesus was alive. I knew he had changed my life, and uh, just excited about being a follower of Jesus, but I was also, in a, in a way, struggling for a long time. Uh, I would see certain friends of mine who had come to the Lord, and they were living for the Lord, they were witnessing to other people, you know, they were growing in their prayer life and in their knowledge of the Bible, and, you know, I believed in the Bible, I believed in prayer, I believed in witnessing, I just didn't do it, and uh, I remember as a young Christian feeling like, what's wrong with me? Why, why is it other people seem to have giftings? Why is it other people uh, seem to have zeal for the Lord and a desire to serve Him, and I, I just don't know that I I'm a very good Christian. And I tried hard. <laughs> I even tried harder. It didn't seem to do much at all. And I came to a point in my life, I was in college now, and 
where I just I remember one night I was at a, it was a Bible study and I was just feeling so discouraged. And I remember feeling like I just want to give up. I just want to give up. This is not working. I'm in my, I, I'm, a, I'm a failure as a Christian. And that night, it just so happened that nobody knew I was feeling that way, but the guy who was leading the Bible study invited people that were there to make a total surrender to the Lord. And he didn't have us raise our hands. There was no altar call. It was a small group, maybe about 15 of us, college-age kids. And so he said, if you want to, if you want to do that tonight, you just pray this prayer that I'm going to pray. And he prayed a brief prayer. I can't even tell you what he prayed. But I prayed that prayer just quietly in my heart. Just so, kind of really more discouraged still. Thinking, Lord, I'm so sorry. That's me. I'm just blowing it. But uh, I do. I, I give up, Lord. And, and, you know, it was almost like I felt like God was saying, I've been waiting for you to say that. Because literally that night, not only did I feel encouraged after I had prayed this prayer of consecration, but something radically started changing. And I don't mean in the next few years. I mean in the next few minutes after I prayed that prayer. And the way it manifested itself in my life is that I started wanting to read my Bible. Some of you have heard me show this before. I was a TV addict. Um, you know, uh, some of you who are my age realize, how could you know so many stories from the 60s and 70s and TV shows? I've long forgotten all that junk. And well, because I watched too much of it. And uh, so I, I would, the first way that exper this experience started changing my life is I would have regular shows that I would watch, like some of us have now maybe. But certain, you know, it wasn't, you couldn't record things back then. This is before VCRs even. This is way back, me and Fred Flintstone, you know. And, uh, but I remember, you know, certain nights my shows were on. Well, every night when my shows were on, but certain ones I really liked. I liked cop shows and detective shows and and uh, so I remember I was walking in to go watch one of my shows. And, and as I was walking in, the Holy Spirit, I know it was God, spoke to me. And he said, go read my word. And I, I remember feeling it like, well, Lord, I can't right now. I'm going to go watch Mannix or whatever it was I was going to go watch. And, uh, but the Lord just spoke to me again. And I never heard God speak to me. Really, I didn't. Uh, but I heard this really clear in my heart. Go read my word. And I thought, I really don't want to. <laughs> but if you're telling me to, then I, I'll do it. And I'm going to miss the show, but I'll go. And I, it was as simple as that. I turned around, walked back to my bedroom, opened my Bible, and started reading my Bible. I don't even know what I read. But I do remember when I read it, it was different than I had ever read it before. It was like God was speaking directly to me this time. And I was spending time with the Lord. I wasn't just doing something religious that I should have done. That's kind of how it began. But the more I read, the more I wanted to read. And God started a fire within me for my relationship with him. It wasn't for ministry. It wasn't designed about, it wasn't anything like that. It was just about a passion that God placed in my heart to know him. Well, I would come to understand that, didn't know what it was at the time, that what God had done is baptized me in the Holy Spirit that night. It was shortly after that, actually. I, I turned 18, I got baptized in water and God called me into the ministry. But I think about that when I think about this passage. Listen, um, Abraham, as you study the life of Abraham, you'll find that just about everywhere he went, he built, anybody know? Altars. If he goes somewhere, he builds an altar. He goes somewhere else, he builds an altar. It's been said he was an altered man, and that's true. Um, Isaac, however, especially in this chapter, but his life is really associated not so much with building altars, although he does build one in this text, Really, it's associated with digging wells, which is some fascinating typology for us when it comes to water. Uh, obviously, water in the Middle East, as it is everywhere in the world, is precious, and uh, especially in Israel. So much of their water, they have to, uh, when, they, when, they, when it does rain, in the short time that it does rain, they have to hold on to it in cisterns uh, because literally they couldn't have any crops. They would die because it's such an uh, arid land. And so water is life, still in the Middle East to our day, but especially in the ancient world. So God uses water as a symbol of himself. Jot it down, Jeremiah 2 and verse 13. Listen to what God said to the people of Israel through Jeremiah. He said, my people have committed two evils. First of all, they have forsaken me. Who are you, Lord? 
I am the fountain of living waters. And here's the second thing they've done. They not only have forsaken me, but they are hewing or carving for themselves cisterns, even broken cisterns that can hold no water. In other words, they're trying to replace me with other things in their life that will never work. And so often, it's not just, you know, the world's that's doing it. He's talking about his people. We have this tendency. We know the Lord, but we ignore the Lord. We forsake the Lord. We try to replace the Lord for satisfaction, and it never works. And it's as ancient as God's people are. Another fascinating passage is Numbers 21, verses 16 and 17. Numbers 21. It says of God's people, for there they continued to be, by the way, the word beer, <laughs> I know what it means in English, it means well, we'll see that here tonight, for they continued to the well, that is the well where the Lord said to Moses, assemble the people that I may give them water. Then Israel sang this song, spring up, O well, and sing to it. Now, Remember when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they're following maybe a million and a half of them after Moses and following after the Lord who's leading them by the pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night to the promised land. And while they are there in the wilderness, it's not long before they run out of water on purpose. God wants them to go through this. But they're thinking they're out here and they're going to die of thirst. And so God calls Moses to gather the people together and he said, stand before the people at Mount Oreb. And he said, Here's what I want you to do. You take that staff, Moses, and you smite the rock right in front of everybody. And when you do, water is going to pour out and I'm going to provide for my people. This miracle happens, which by the way is interpreted in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians, that the rock is a type or a picture of Jesus Christ. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, that, that, it's the, that he is the source of life, but only after he is smitten. And so Jesus Christ dies on the cross and becomes the source of eternal life to man. It's a beautiful picture. But God told Moses to do that. It physically happened and literally water for a million and a half people to drink and have provision for their trip. However, later on, an interesting thing happens. Many of you remember this, that they become thirsty again sometime later. And uh, so God says, gather them together again. And this time, he doesn't tell him to smite the rock. What does he tell Moses to do? Speak to the rock. Just speak to the rock, and water will come out. That's a very interesting thing. Moses kind of loses his cool. He gets mad at the people. Shall I bring water from you stiff? He's all ticked off. And so what does he do? He hits the rock again with his staff twice. And water does come out, but God has a problem well, Moses has a problem, but God takes Moses to task and said, you're not going to go into the promised land. You didn't treat me as holy before my people. In other words, you're ticked off. I'm not. They need water. You didn't obey me. Now, it's a very interesting type. The rock is a picture of Christ. It must be smitten, but it's only smitten once. Jesus Christ does not have to repeatedly die for our sins to provide for our needs. Once he is smitten, all you have to do is ask. All you have to do is speak to the rock and that water, that type and picture of the Holy Spirit is available to you. So we're going to talk a little bit about the idea of this well and these wells that are being built and learn some principles about the Holy Spirit tonight. So the first principle is this, it's pretty obvious in the text, and that's the enemy seeks to stop the flow in our lives. The enemy <laughs> seeks to stop the flow in verse 15 through 22. Take a look back here. We see that all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, the Philistines, so those are the enemies of God's people, stopped them up by filling them with earth. That's kind of interesting to me. If the water is a type and a picture of the presence of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, how does the enemy stop the flow of the life that comes from God? It's the dirt of the world. <laughs> That is exactly the case. He uses the dirt of the world to clog up and choke off the flow of God's presence and God's power in our life. And I want you to jot down Mark 4 and verse 19. Remember what Jesus said. This is part of the parable of the sower. But the worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word, 
and it becomes unfruitful. Take a look down in verse 16. Then Abimelech, he's the king of Gerar, said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are too powerful for us. Very interesting. Here's a guy, God is blessing him. If you read the verses right before this, God has blessed him a hundredfold. He's becoming wealthy. He's digging wells, which is good for him and good for everybody. But his blessing is becoming a problem to the people of the land, even the king. And I think about when Jesus came to Gadara. Gadara is not a Jewish city. It's one of the ten cities of what's known as the Decapolis. It's a Greek city. And yet there were some Jews that lived there, but there were also Gentiles. Most Jews would not even go there. But Jesus came with his disciples across the Sea of Galilee and entered into Gadara. And you remember the welcoming committee of Gadara? Yeah, it wasn't the mayor or the people. It wasn't the Jews. It was just one guy, a guy who we would say was absolutely nuts. Uh, because this man was demon-possessed, had a legion of demons, thousands of demons inhabiting him, out of control, lived in the tombs, used to take rocks and cut himself and bleed and scream and yell. I mean, he must have been an absolute nightmare for the town of Gadara. Uh, and Jesus, well, actually, the man runs out to Jesus. We know who you are, Jesus of Nazareth. The demons are speaking. I mean, it's this crazy scene. And you remember what happens, how that Jesus commands the demons to leave the man and go into what? Yeah, a bunch of pigs, which tells you a little bit about how Jewish this was, uh, this community. But he, he cast them into the pigs. The pigs run down the hill and they drown themselves. But the man is, is released from the, from the demons, which has got to be a beautiful thing. The man is, I love this uh, verse. It just says that the man is next seen sitting at Jesus' feet, which is, remember, that's where Mary was sitting when he said to his sister, hey, get in on this. <laughs> He's sitting at Jesus' feet. He's clothed. How long has it been since the guy wore anything? I don't know. Somebody gave him some clothes or Jesus made him manifest. I don't know. But he's wearing clothes. And more importantly than everything, he's in his right mind. He's been saved. He's been rescued by Jesus. And all he wants to do is go with Jesus. And Jesus says, no, you know, can't do that. But what's very interesting is this beginning of a work of Gadara. You, I've always thought they should make Jesus the town hero or the mayor or something, you know. But what did the people of the town come out and say to Jesus? Same thing that Abimelech is saying to Isaac. Please leave. We don't want you here. Even though God is using you, God is blessing you, and it's good for us, we don't want you here. And that's a very interesting thing to me, that whether it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit on the unbelievers around us, or jealousy, which evidently that was part of the problem, they were envious, by the way, do you know why the leaders of Israel delivered Jesus up to the Romans? Envy, the Bible says. It was envy. That was their motive. They did not like how, it, how popular Jesus was becoming among the people. And so because of that, they delivered him up. I think of Paul. There in Acts 16, is in Philippi. And he's been called by the Lord to go minister. He had that vision of the Macedonian man come over and help us. He gets over there. Remember, he's ministering to to Lydia and down by the riverside, the handful of women that get, you know, they hear the word. And, but there's this little slave girl. And every day Paul's going out to minister is following him. And she's demon possessed. And she is actually advertising who he is. He's, he's, he's the, I mean, she's saying the truth about who he is, preaching the gospel. And, but it's coming from a little girl who's demon possessed. And so he casts the demon out of the girl. But now everybody should say, Thank you. She's been demon-possessed. That was so nice. What do they do? No, we're going to arrest you. We're going to beat you because we were making money over, by her fortune-telling. In the same way, the same thing's happening. When the Spirit of God is on your life and using you, there will be people who don't appreciate it. Even though it should bring a blessing to them, they would like you just to be gone. And so interesting, he's, this, this whole thing with the well, they're, they're trying to clog it up. They're trying to stop the flow. You know, I shared with a man... Um, who doesn't attend our church, but he is a worship leader. And we were talking about the days of revival in the uh, 70s. And we were talking, he asked me, you know, when I started attending Calvary Chapel, I said, oh, in the tent days in 1973. And he goes, man, I wasn't even alive back then. You know, I hear all these stories, but, but I wasn't even born yet. But, but here's the reality. Who cares? What God did in the past is not you have no loss if you didn't live through the tent days. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
What he did historically is irrelevant. What's important to know is that he's available presently to do everything that he wants to do right now. But you can't, just like Isaac can't inherit the wells from his father Abraham, you and I cannot inherit or reproduce a previous generation's experience with the Holy Spirit. So even though the enemy's putting all this dirt in there to close up, the fact is it also tells us that the Lord wants to do something new in our generation, right now in our generation. Uh, jot down Lamentations 5 and verse 21. Lamentations 5, 21, a good prayer to pray. Restore us to you, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old. And it's interesting. It says that Isaac gave the same names to these wells. Why? Because it's the very same Holy Spirit that will move today in your life who moved in the days of the book of Acts or at any revival throughout history. Um, jot down John 7 and verse 37. Look at, uh, while you're jotting that down, look at verse 19 in our text. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well known as of flowing water. Now this is different. Usually well water is not flowing water. So they dug down, they actually found a spring is what this is talking about, which is fascinating to me. Then the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with the herdsmen of Isaac saying, the water's ours. <laughs> Flowing water, or what would be called normally living water, by the way, I, I think some people don't know this, we all think of living water as, well, that's the Holy Spirit. It's true, it's a picture of the Holy Spirit, but living water in the Bible means spring water, water that's actually bubbling up from the ground, not just a pool of water, not a pond, not actually a river particularly, but spring water. And if you've ever drank from a, an actual spring, you know how good that water tastes. Well, Jesus uses this, this word to speak of the power of the Holy Spirit in John 7 and verse 37. It says, now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And then John says uh, that he was speaking of the Holy Spirit when he said, and out of his innermost being shall flow, what? Rivers of living water. And then John says, this is, he spoke about the Holy Spirit who was not yet given because Jesus Christ had not been glorified. Our kids from time to time sing a song, uh, dig down deep <laughs> and there's still more. Dig down deep, it's a well without a floor. In other words, the, the depth of what God's Spirit wants to do in our lives, we haven't exhausted it, we haven't reached it. God wants to do far more. And so they find a well or they dig, dig it up and there's a problem, there's uh, contention with the people of the land. So they named it Ezek, which means contention. And then it happens again and they name it Sitna, which means enmity. It's interesting because those are two of the works of the flesh in the New Testament that quench the Holy Spirit, spoken about in the book of Galatians. Enmity, strife, problems with other people, those are ways to grieve and quench the Holy Spirit. It happens in our life too. You go, you know, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you get up, you can't wait, and then you get on the freeway. And so I'm like, okay, <laughs> kind of lost it there. And I'm not just talking about getting in a bad mood. The fact is sin separates us from God. And now it doesn't mean you lose your salvation, but God says this, my ear is not dull that it can't hear, my arm is not short that it can't say, but your sin has made a separation between me and you. We need to get restored to the Lord. Uh, the psalmist said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God won't hear my prayer. So when we move into the day and we don't allow the Spirit of God to lead us and fill us and give us his patience with other people, but in our flesh we react and respond and get mad and frustrated, we, we grieve the Holy Spirit. We quench the Holy Spirit. And so here we have these wells being dug and the enemy not being pleased with it. And I like the fact that he just keeps digging. <laughs> because I think in a sense for people, maybe here in this room, you feel like, I don't know what you're talking about, about the Holy Spirit. You know, uh, the Holy Spirit is the anchor man of the Trinity. We all study and know a lot about the Father. We've had fathers and of course Jesus is our focus. But the Holy Spirit is kind of an enigma to a lot of Christians what does the Holy Spirit do, you know? Well, the Holy Spirit is engaged and involved with your Christian life from before you're saved until you're glorified in heaven and every day along the way. From the 
point of convicting you of your sin before you come to Christ, to the regeneration of your spirit, to moving in and living inside of you. You know, we say Jesus lives in us. Actually, the spirit of Christ inhabits us and he begins to sanctify us, to make us more and more like Jesus. He's the one through whom you feel the presence of God. He's the one who convicts you of sin when you blow it. He's the one who reminds you you're really a child of God. He's the one who cries out within you, Abba, Father, to help you to know you're God's child. He's the one who, who reveals God's will and God's word within your heart and speaks to you. He's the one who gifts you to be used in the body of Christ. He's the one who gives you the power to witness to other people. The work of God in your life although the Holy Spirit doesn't usually take the credit for it, because he's always focusing on Jesus, is at work in every believer in this room. But I have a question for you. Have you ever been baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit? I have a more important question than that, maybe. Are you being, are you living in a relationship where you feel like the Spirit of God is filling you on a regular basis and using you in a way that you know that's impossible except that God was in charge of your life. How badly do you desire that work? And do you know how to allow that work to even happen? I want you to jot down a verse, Luke 11 and verse 13. Here's what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. He said, if you then being evil, meaning we're human, that is sinful by nature, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask and continue to ask him? I remember saying, Lord, I want you to control me. I want you to have my life completely, but I don't know how to do that. And I think that there are some Christians who give up. They, they pray a prayer once or twice. They read a book. They hear a sermon. And then they become discouraged when it doesn't happen. I think it's fascinating to me in the text that there's a process, somewhat of a frustrating process, uh, for Isaac to go through until he finally is able to dig that well in that broad place. And he realizes, okay, finally now I can become fruitful. Remember in John 15 how Jesus said, uh, I am the vine, you are the branches. My father's the, the vine dresser. Every branch that abides in me will do what? Bear fruit. In other words, the key of having the life of Christ come into me and through me to become like him, his character, that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, becoming like, it's his life flowing through you, remember, is staying connected to him long enough. When a branch stays connected long enough, it will bear fruit. That's it. So it's keeping from being disconnected that is so important that we learn how to do that. Now, the, so the first principle is the enemy seeks to stop the flow. And maybe he's been very effective in our lives to do that, but there's more. We need to meet God at the well. So if you want to jot that down, look at verse 23. Then Isaac went up from there to Beersheba. By the way, Beersheba is in the southernmost part of Israel, in what's called the Negev. And uh, it's desert. By the way, it's one of the larger cities in Israel. Over 200,000 people live there today. But uh, it is considered the southernmost city because you'll hear people in the Bible talk about all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and down in the south. But um, so he went up from where he was in Gerar to Beersheba and the Lord appeared to him the same night. Now, I find it interesting. As soon as he's in this place, Beersheba means the well of the oath or the well of seven, it could mean either one. And here, as soon as he gets there at the well, I, he hears God say, I am the God of your father Abraham. Don't fear, I'm with you. I'll bless you and multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. Look at the reaction, verse 25. He builds an altar there like his, like his dad, and he calls upon the name of the Lord, and he pitches his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dig a well. Now, Beersheba is already known as the place where Oaths are made before this. In fact, Abraham has signed a covenant with Abimelech. So has Isaac here at uh, Beersheba. So it's a place where men have entered into an oath with the king. But it's interesting when Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit, one of the names of the Holy Spirit is he calls him the promise of the Father. 
In the Gospel of Luke, he tells his disciples to stay in Jerusalem until the promise of the Father is sent upon them. And I love this picture. At Beersheba, there's this working out of the oath, the, the receiving of the promise of God upon uh, Isaac. And just like in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples. But look at all that the Lord does at the well. Everything that you and I want. He reveals himself at the well. As soon as he gets there, he speaks his peace. He promises his presence. He starts promising blessings upon him and his children. By the way, he gives him the covenant that was based totally on grace for the sake of another. It's really a picture of all we have in Jesus Christ when you think about it. See, through Jesus Christ, we receive God's presence. We receive God's promise of blessing for the sake of Jesus Christ. And, of course, we receive his peace. And the response of what happens at the well, you might say the response of somebody that's filled with the Holy Spirit. What happens when you're filled with the Holy Spirit? The same things that happen in our text. Look again at verse uh, 25. What does he do when he hears from God at the well? He builds an altar there. What does an altar speak of? Consecration. Exactly what happened to me there in 1975 at that meeting. When the Spirit of God came on me, I just surrendered my whole life to the Lord. That is your response. How do you know when you're filled with the Holy Spirit? You don't want to hold on to any of your life anymore. You just want Him to have full control. So He builds an altar. An altar speaks of personal sacrifice and of worship. Jot down Romans 12 and verse 1. Paul said, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So first of all, it's consecration. But then notice in the text, after he builds the altar, the next thing he does, he calls on the name of the Lord. So first consecration and then supplication, because we're talking here about prayer. What does it say in Ephesians 5? When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, what will you do? Somebody tell me what it says will happen. How, how do you, what's the evidence you're filled with the Spirit according to Ephesians 5? Anybody know? Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. What will happen? What will that look like? Anybody know? Over here. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. He'll sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and make melody to the Lord. There's going to be communication. When you're filled with the Spirit, one of the evidences is, not only are you dedicating your life to the Lord, but you're starting to communicate to the Lord more than you ever did. Your prayer life will start to change if you're filled with the Spirit of God. And then not only will you be making melody, which is a joyful communication to the Lord, but also it says you'll be giving thanks for all things in the name of Jesus Christ. More prayer. But it's not, Lord, I'm so bummed out, I'm so worried, I'm so... No, you're thankful for where you are, even if things haven't changed at all. He's going to change you from the inside, but you're going to start communicating. You're consecrating yourself, and you're starting to be involved in active communication with the Lord. New appetite for the Word of God, for sure. You start to hear God speak to you, just like Isaac did. This is only the second time we read in Isaac's life where God spoke to him. But God has a lot to say to him, and it's all very, very encouraging him. And that's uh, encouraging uh, the words that God speaks to him. There's no reproof or rebuke. Remember, he has just gotten back from blowing it in this chapter where he said to Abimelech that his wife was his sister. You know, that was, that was not so good. But God forgave him for that, and there's no comments about that. It's all very encouraging things about what God's pl plans are uh, for his future. So I told you that I had an appetite for the Word of God when the Spirit of God baptized me, but also my prayer life started to change. I wanted to pray. I wanted to talk to Him. I wanted to share with Him. It wasn't just during my prayer times. It was all the time. It was when I was in my car. It was when I first woke up. Sometimes he'd wake me up in the middle of the night. I didn't always enjoy that, but I enjoyed talking to him. There was one time my car broke down. I'll never forget, I had this old jalopy of a car. I was a poor student, and uh, it broke down, right? Uh, I remember, right at Kramer and Chapman, and it was like midnight. And I lived out, you know, that's, that's close to I lived out in Europe, a few, three or four miles away. And uh, I'll never forget, I had just been studying the book of James, 
which says there in James 1, you know, count it all joy whenever you encounter various trials. And one of the things we studied was, you know, the secret of overcoming trials and that go through them by faith is whenever you first encounter the trial, because that's really what the text says, count it joy, consider it joy right when it starts. Instead of going, oh, no, what am I going to do? Yeah, forget it, too late. So uh, I, I got out of the car and I went back to get my spare. And I opened the trunk because I had a flat tire. And uh, I remember getting it out and I went, oh, no, it, it was flat, too. I'm thinking, wait a minute, I remember James chapter 1. Okay, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but you're doing something. It's good. I don't know. That doesn't seem good because I have no way to get home. And I remember I went over to the police department to use a payphone, you see it was a while ago, and, uh, and I, I didn't have a dime. I had no money. I went, all right, this is even getting better. And it was just like everything that was bad that could happen in that circumstance, I needed to get home and get some sleep. But here's what I sensed. I sensed, I sensed God saying, hey, Bob, hey, Bob, I want to spend some time with you. And since you're going to walk home these three or four miles anyway, be with me. Because you would have been home in about five minutes driving your car, wouldn't have probably even talked to me. So let's be together. I literally felt like God was saying, let's be together. So you know what I did? I jogged home, and I worshiped the Lord the whole way. On the side of the road as I'm just jogging and talking, it was the best flat tire I've ever had in my life. It was awesome. Here's the thing. When the Holy Spirit is on your life, things that are bummers turn into blessings. It, everything changes. When the Spirit of God gives you a different perspective, and you start talking to the Lord, and you realize He didn't have to let me have a flat tire. He didn't have to let the spare be flat. He could have put a, made sure I had a dime in my pocket, or there was somebody that would loan me one. If if all those things happen that way, there's a reason. It's not like well, that has nothing to do with God. It has everything to do with God. Not because He's trying to just test my faith. Hey, see what happens when this happens. <laughs> no, because I literally sense He wanted some time with me. It took me about 20 minutes, half an hour, a jog home. And I got home. I, yeah, I was exhausted. And someone had to drive me there the next day to get I couldn't care less. I spent a half an hour with the king of the universe. <sighs> you meet God at the well. And suddenly, instead of doing devotions every morning or whenever you do them, you start having devotion. Trade in your devotions <laughs> for devotion. And by the way, it says he pitched a tent. By the way, you might remember he had stopped living in a tent in the previous two weeks ago when we studied. In Gerar, he was just living evidently in a house, but he's back to living in a tent. What does living in a tent represent in Scripture, in the Old Testament? Huh? Can't hear you. A sojourner, somebody who is not here permanently, uh, somebody who's, uh, you know, passing through for us, we'd say it this way. He's living by faith. He's living by faith. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not about this life. It's not about the things you can possess. It's suddenly about heaven, your permanent dwelling place. This is what the book of Hebrews says. None of these Old Testament patriarchs had any permanent possessions because they didn't consider this about getting stuff here. And so he's back living in a tent. I love that. And uh, by the way, look at, look at the text one more time. Look at verse 25, right at the end. He built an altar there. He called on the name of the Lord. He pitched his tent, and there Isaac's servants dug a well. That's going to come back up in a moment, but his servants dug a well. You know, when you live filled by, led by, empowered by the Holy Spirit, the people around you are going to see something in you. They're digging wells, and I think that's interesting to me. If you want your kids to be obedient, if you want them to be respectful, you can order them to be respectful. Say thank you, say please, do what I tell you to do, because thus saith the grandpa. Try that. See how that goes. They may do it, but inside there's no submission to you, probably, other than fear. But you know what? When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, something changes where people see what's happening in your life, and they want what you have. 
I love the fact that it says the servants started digging a well. Man, that's awesome. They want the same experience. The final principle is this. Our witness flows from this well. We're going to see his witness start in verse 26 and following. Then Abimelech came to him. He's living at Beersheba. He's in relationship with the Lord. He's hearing from God. He's living in his tent. He's living by faith. And this Gentile king comes to him, verse 26, from Gerar, and he's bringing some people with him. An advisor named Ahuzeth, and I know it looks like Phicol, but it's pronounced in Hebrew, Pekol, the commander of his army. So he's got a secretary of state, you might say, and his general. Verse 27, Isaac said to them, why have you come to me since you hate me? <laughs> Don't sugarcoat it. Tell them how you feel. And uh, you've sent me away from you. You told me to leave, remember? Of course, he's, he forgets why he did that, because he had lied to them and caused a bunch of problems. They said, we see plainly the Lord has been with you. These are non-believers. We see plainly the Lord has been with you. So we said, let there now be an oath between us, even between you and us. Let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm, just as we have not touched you and have done you nothing but good, that wasn't exactly true, and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. Then Isaac made a, a feast for them, and they ate and drank. And in the morning they arose early and exchanged oaths. Then Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. Now, Isaac has freshly been kind of receiving revelation from the Lord and communication with the Lord, but that was in private. But he starts living by faith practically, and we see it affects the way other people around him in his culture, basically how they see him personally. You know, um, the Holy Spirit doesn't just produce, uh, just produce changes within you to be a little secret intimacy with the Lord. They said, we see plainly the Lord is with you. In other words, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it'll change you for sure. But it'll change people's view of you as well. It should. How do people know that we're Christians? How do they know? Is it because, you know, they know we go to church? Is it because of our bumper stickers? You know? Oh, they must be a Christian. You know? He is greater than I. They don't even know what that means, by the way. Nobody knows. Most Christians don't have a clue what that one means. But uh, it's really this secret thing. It's like the fish, you know. Uh, Christians are into fishing. Um, no, that's not the way people should know that we're Christians. We start humming, I am a see, I am a see. That's not it either. Um, but the work of God on our life should affect us in such a way that other people know there's something different. Jot it down, Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 3. Arise and shine, for your light has come, the Lord says, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, deep darkness the people's, but the Lord will rise upon you and his glory will appear upon you. So here's the idea. God illuminates us so others can be drawn to him, kind of like a moth to a candle. Um, Psalm 18, verses 28 and 29, David says this, For you light my lamp, talking to God, the Lord God, my God, illumines my darkness, for by you I can run upon a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. Do you hear what he's saying? God, you're the one who gives me a light that people can see, and you give me abilities to do what otherwise I could not do. Do you remember what happened when the Spirit of God came on Saul before he was king? Somebody in here remembers that. Raise your hand if you can tell us. What happened when the Holy Spirit came on Saul before before he actually became king. Yeah. He was found among the prophets and? He was prophesying. Here's, an, here's a great verse. Jot it down. 1 Samuel 10 and verse 6. This is Samuel predicting, prophesying what's going to happen to Saul when the Holy Spirit comes on him. He says, Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily, and you shall prophesy, which is what uh, it was just said. But notice this you will be changed into another man. Can I tell you something? Saul already believed in Jehovah. He already believed in God. He wasn't some kind of Gentile. He believed he was raised with faith in Jehovah. He was circumcised. He was a Jew. If you want to become more like Jesus Christ, if you want to become 
a different person. As a believer, the way that happens is the Holy Spirit coming upon you. Remember what Jesus said? He said to his disciples, stay in Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. The Spirit of God will come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. Until, they already had the message. They had all the content of the gospel. But they didn't have the power, not just, listen, here's something a lot of people don't understand. Witnessing isn't about just conveying information. Jesus said, you shall be witnesses. He didn't just say you will give information. You will be evidence. You will be witnesses that I'm alive. You'll know that I'm alive, but it's who you are. It's the way you're living that's going to be the witness. This is what a lot of people don't understand. It's not just about, I have the boldness now to tell people they need to get saved. No, it's about your changed life. It's a, you are an evidence, a witness of the resurrection. Why? Because the resurrection power is alive in you. And you're in love with somebody who you know is alive, but other people have never met. You, are, you will be my witnesses, you see. But it's when the Spirit of God is indwelling and coming upon each one of us. And so these enemies of Isaac make a, a peace treaty with him. Proverbs 16 and verse 7 gives us the principle. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Now it's interesting, when Jacob, later in, in the book of Genesis uh, is finally broken by the Lord. Remember, he's crippled by the Lord. Um, and he, he's changed. His name becomes Israel. And he's literally, he can't fight Esau. Esau's coming with 400 men. Last time he, he was around Esau, well, he was running from Esau the last time because Esau said, I'm going to kill you. And so he ran for his life. And he hasn't seen him for years. But he hears Esau is coming with a welcoming party of 400 men. And he's terrified. He wrestles with the Lord, he's broken, his name's changed. He is now crippled or disabled. He's, he's literally leaning on his staff. He can't fight. He's not going to even try. Because after he got changed, after he got broken, he's just going to rely on the Lord. If God, you know, if I'm gonna, the Lord's going to take me out, he's going to take me out. Very interesting. God changes Esau's heart. I have no doubt Esau originally, when he heard he was coming, intended to kill him. But when Esau gets to him, he just embraces him. He just kisses him. I miss you, brother. It's like, really? <laughs> yeah. I thought you wanted to kill me. No, not anymore. I just miss you. Like, the Lord did that. When your ways are pleasing to the Lord, he can make even your enemies be at peace with you. And that's exactly what happens uh, in this text. And so they come to him, the king, his general, and they basically have said to each other, we don't want to be on the wrong side of this guy. We, we can see, isn't it amazing when non-Christians can see the Lord in someone's life? We see the Lord has blessed you. We see, man, we, we want to be your friend. You know, mainly because we would hate to have the Lord against us. Awesome. You know, Laban later will do that in Genesis 31. He'll make an oath with Jacob. And he'll say, I know that the Lord's blessed me because of you. And then when Jacob leaves, he, he makes an oath with Jacob. And it's a very similar kind of a thing. Um, there's these last couple of verses I want us to notice before we end the, the, the study here. Verse 34 um, says this, when Esau was 40 years old, so it kind of shifts gears from Isaac and just two verses on Esau. When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Biri, the Hittite, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. So we've already talked about how Isaac's a picture of a child of promise. Um, he is the one whom the covenant will be with, and he's the picture of Christ in the scripture, um, and how Esau is not. Esau is a type of a man of the flesh. He goes after the things of the world. But it's interesting, Esau gets married, but a couple things I want you to notice. First of all, he, the first person he marries, what's her name? Judith. Judith. Guess what her name means? Her name means Jewess, um, as in Jew, a woman who's a Jew. She's not a Jew, though. She's a Hittite. It's very interesting. Her name really comes from the word Judah, which will be one of the later names of one of the tribes. But back here, that, he's not alive yet. Judah means praise the Lord. 
very interesting. You have a Hittite, a, a non-follower of Jehovah, who's naming his daughter a name that would have the appearance of someone of faith. But it appears that that's all it is, just a name. Uh, Just kind of the appearance of faith. And so Esau's marrying a woman who has the kind of name that we would like to see, but there's no evidence of faith in him or of her. But he also then marries again, which is also interesting. Now his dad is Isaac. Isaac has one wife. But how many did grandpa have? Abraham had, remember, Sarah and Hagar. It's very interesting. Esau is kind of living after the flesh and making the same bad mistakes that his grandpa did when he failed in his marriage. And uh, he becomes not only a picture uh, continuously of doing those things that dishonor the Lord with his marriage, with his life, but the last verse of the chapter, these women brought literally bitterness to Isaac and to Rebekah. So you have on the one hand, Isaac living by the well, bringing blessing to everybody around him, uh, bringing, you know, in touch with the Lord God, speaking to him, people want to be on his side, and this the blessing of God. But then you see in his children, or at least one of his sons, uh, bitterness coming his way. Let me say it this way. Listen, you can be an on-fire, spirit-filled Christian. That does not guarantee you your children will be. Each child, every one of our children, have to make their own decisions about that. You can model it in front of them. It won't make them spirit-filled. Now, it is one of the best ways to help them want to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to obey the Lord is to, again, don't try to get your kids to be obedient. Teach them about the work of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit will teach them about obedience uh, from the inside. But I like the fact that it says on the same day that he makes peace with his enemies that his uh, Isaac's servants came to him and said, we found the well. What a blessing. Because he had wells taken away from him by the enemy. He never punished them for it. He never sued them for it. You know, when you allow yourself to be wronged without reacting, justifying revenge. You know, one of the problems we have is when we're wrong, we're most apt to do wrong. When somebody hurts you and offends you, we are so tempted, we feel so justified to get angry, to yell, to punish back. And Isaac does not do that. They steal his wells. He says nothing. He just moves on. When we honor the Lord by letting go of things that people do to hurt us without taking offense and taking our own justice, God will give it back to you. On the same day that he's meeting with these people, making friends, letting it go, what they've done wrong, the Lord has his servants come in, guess what, we just dug a well, we found water. It's very cool what I see here. It was uh, William Temple, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who once said, when I stop praying, the coincidences, the coincidences stop happening. When I stop, and I feel like that's true. When you're walking by the Holy Spirit, God starts doing things. And twice the phrase is used, on the same day, or on that same night he went to Beersheba, God appears. It's like, have you ever been waiting for God to do something for weeks or months or years and nothing seems to be happening? It's like there are other times when, when you're right with the Lord and suddenly things are happening left and right. It's almost like, whoa, it's just happening so fast around you. And that's kind of what's happening in Isaac's life. God starts revealing to him, blessing him, making promises to him. And then this well is found, just as he's obeying the Lord, it's very, very cool Same day he forgives what they've taken away, God gives it back to him. And then kind of this this last principle, uh, and that is this, I want to come back to this idea that he, they had to dig a well, it didn't work. They dug a well, it didn't work because it was the enemy uh, frustrated. And then finally, the third time around, um, they dig a well and they find this flowing water. You know, I think there are many people who desire to be filled by the Holy Spirit, but they're not desperate. You say, what do you mean by that? The Holy Spirit doesn't fill people because of curiosity. He fills people when it's a necessity in their life. What did David say? As the deer pants, 
The word is only used one other time in the Old Testament. In Hebrew, it means to cry out. It speaks of animals who are dying of thirst, crying out to drink. As the deer cries out or pants after the water brook, so thirst my soul for thee, O God. It's not enough to have a desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I think we have to be desperate. And we need to stay the course. We need to ask and keep asking. Jesus said, when you ask, don't give up. Remember when he talked about prayer? This is true of everything about prayer. He said that the problem is we ask and then we say, ah, oh, God didn't want to do it. And he gave us an illustration. Remember, the guy who has some friends come late at night. He has no food to put before them. So he says, oh, man, I'll go next door. Go, it's late at night, knocks on the door. Hey, I need some food. I didn't get the Stater Brothers, and I'm, I'm embarrassed. And, and what does the guy say? Go away. We're all in bed sleeping until you showed up. Come to the door. Go away. And Jesus said, the man will not get up because he's your friend and help you. But he will go up, get up and help you because of you won't stop knocking. Jesus said, don't give up. Keep asking. Ask and keep asking and it will be given to you. May I encourage you, if you want a fresh work of the Holy Spirit, don't give up. Keep digging. <laughs> There's still more. Let's pray. Father, I pray for those that are dry, those that are discouraged. I pray for those that feel like they haven't witnessed for you lately or maybe ever. I pray for those who feel like sin has crept back into their life and taken them captive again. Lord, or that their fleshly desires are so much stronger than their spiritual desires. I pray for those who struggle with praying even when they've set time aside. And those who read the word and they feel like they get nothing out of it. Lord, I thank you that you have made all of us capable. In fact, you've made all of us designed for eternity to be spiritual beings who bring you glory. But Lord, every one of us needs the same work. We need to surrender our lives that you might control and consume and fill us afresh. So I pray for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit on me, on our church, on the body of Christ in Southern California. I pray you would bring revival to us and you'd restore to us, as you did in the days of old, a fresh work. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.